Slayers, it is time to fulfill your oaths made in Carrick Cadrin. Ungrim Iron Fist, one of the great generals of the dwarven race and a fierce warrior. Such a flagrant lie, for Ungrim is as useful as a general as a torch is to a blind person. Ultimately, any general leading a bunch of dwarves on a suicide mission will end poorly, a fact acknowledged by their leaders during the War of the Beard, but not Ungrim. He embraces the Slayer. He is the Slayer, and with that comes the worst army imaginable from a race short on numbers and with a terrible ability to replace any losses. Instead of the sane method of annihilating your enemy from ranged with one of the most powerful combinations of crossbowmen and artillery, Ungrim's army will instead charge straight, wearing no armor, expecting glorious victory. What they shall find is the stupid death the dwarves deserve for their stubbornness. Welcome everyone, Costini here with my campaign overview guide for Ungrim Iron Fist of the Dwarves. He is the worst dwarf and legendary lord in the game, as I have covered in another video that I will be linking in at the end of this one, as well as my dwarf survival guide. But here's what you need to know about the dwarves and why Ungrim is the worst. So the dwarves, if we're looking at their army roster, the dwarves excel in a ranged fight. They excel with artillery, they excel with quarrelers, eventually with thunders, with iron drakes, with cannons, all that. So the dwarves are a ranged focused faction and they are good at that. Their quarrelers, their regular ones, have a bronze shield so they can dish out a lot of damage from range and they can also take a lot of damage from range. And this is the playstyle you want to embrace when you're playing a dwarven legendary lord because the dwarves have no way to increase their replenishment with the exception of one single structure over here, the barley field, which even at tier four is only going to account for 5% casualty replenishment. It's mainly there for growth. It's not there for casualty replenishment benefits. That's a secondary benefit. There are mods that do increase that. There is a mod that can help you a great deal and really make your dwarven campaigns a lot better. And that is the priest with the uh, plus 14 percent casualty replenishment mod but even with that regardless of whether or not you're using mods or dwarves you want to focus on their range power it's better for sieges it's better for open field battles the problem for ungram is his campaign benefits be it his faction benefits or his lord benefits are focused on improving the slayers so Ungram gets a minus 75% construction cost for Slayer buildings, minus 50% recruitment cost for Slayers, and 10% speed for infantry units. On top of that, he gets a minus 25% upkeep for Slayers, 5 melee attack, and ability Journey's End. Now Journey's End, what it does is that entities can't die while hit points are greater than 75%. But this is not a particularly great benefit for slayers because since they have no armor whatsoever they're going to take a significant amount of damage in both melee and ranged yes slayers do have a bronze shield but they're still going to take a lot of damage if you take a slayer army and charge straight up against any army that has decent ranged which includes the green skins i might add even their baseline goblin archers can do a lot of damage from ranged if you take a dwarven army and charge across the field towards an army that has any kind of decent range capability, they're going to take significant casualties even before they arrive. Now, Ungram's skill line, uh, he does benefit, he does get in a great deal of power with death blow, benefits against green skin, vampire counts, or chaos. He does get 15% casualty replenishment for slayers and charge bonus, which is useful to replenish the slayers even if you're playing without mods, because they will take a lot of damage. But the problem is, None of his benefits, not the melee attack, not the charge bonus, not bonus versus large, none of that improves the Slayer's durability. Slayers have good melee stats. They have good leadership. Which that good leadership will offset the loss of armor compared to the regular Dwarven units, and because they're unbreakable, they'll tend to do well and not resolve. But they will suffer significant casualties more so than any other dwarven unit and again you don't have the best replenishment and even ungrim with slayers it's only for his own army that you have that good casualty replenishment on top of that ungrim's campaign situation is not that great the best i can say about ungrim is you can play him as a generic dwarven lore like what you do is in in um 
in Karakadrin, what you do is you start building artillery, you get some slayers turn one, like you defeat this army, you get this slayer over here, you get some slayers, then you cancel the slayer shrine, or maybe you wait another turn, get more slayers, then you cancel the slayer shrine, and get a regular barracks, so you can start pumping out quarrelers for a second lord, which you then give those quarrelers to Ingram, and you can make him a pretty good uh, generic lord, or a better version of a generic lord, uh, because he will be much better in combat than a generic lord, because unlike the slayer he uh, slayers he commands, Ungram is actually a heavily armored lord. Now, he doesn't have a shield, so he's going to take quite a bit of damage from ranged, but in a melee fight, Ungram is quite powerful. But that's about it when it comes to the faction benefits. So if you're playing this faction, the best thing you can do from an army perspective is really consider the fact that you don't have really any useful faction benefits, and you're really just playing a generic dwarf lord. And the problem with that is, if this was a race like the Greenskins, if it, this was a race like the Vampire Counts or the Warriors of Chaos, that would not be so much of an issue because those are powerful races. But the Dwarves are one of the weakest races currently in the game. They have a good army, but they don't have much else that really works for them. They, their economy can take a while to get uh, started. The problem with their economy is that uh, a lot of things are expensive. So a lot of things, a lot of structures, a lot of units can be pretty expensive. So their early game economy can suffer. Now, late game, you do have potential. You do have the Feast Hall, which will produce kegs. They'll sell for a lot of gold if you do decide to sell them. You do get benefits from the guild marketplace when it comes to your trade. So I think when it comes to late game potential, the dwarves can have an incredible economy, probably second only to the high elves, believe it or not, or high elves and dark elves. Uh, when it comes to just like trade and raw income like the Greenskins will generate a lot more money but that's because they get so much money from sacking settlements whereas you playing the dwarves will get a lot of money from trading especially if you get a lot of dwarven kegs so just something to be aware of right off the bat with ungrim and the issues he has but beyond that there are other issues there's the grudges. So you start with the grudge to take this territory in your starting province, and you have a grudge aimed specifically at Vlad. Not the vampire counts, Vlad. You have to go to war against Vlad, fight a couple of battles. And then you have a grudge against Azak, and then a grudge against basically Skaven, because Skaven are generally going to take uh, this uh, particular uh, settlement, Carrick flag, uh, over here. So Clan Farrakh, which starts over here in Karak Doom is going to march over there and take over Karak Flag. And so you're going to end up in a situation where you're going to have to fight them if you want to deal with your grudges. The benefit with grudges, though, is you start at an Earth level, so you're going to have that research benefit, that control benefit, which is basically a growth benefit, and that 10 diplomatic relations. It's quite easy enough to maintain severity level of Irked if you're playing as Ungram. You don't have to rush the grudges. In fact, rushing the grudges is probably the worst thing you could do. See, the thing about this campaign, when you look at this at the first glance, you might think, oh, okay, so I just wipe out Red Eye Mountain and then go deal with Azag, then deal with Vlad, then deal with the Silver Pinnacle. No. What you want to do, there are various choices. You do have a bunch of choices, but you're also kind of limited in your campaign plan. So you could take out the region here, then turn directly around and throw your Slayer army against Vlad. Because while Slayers are going to be b bad against Greenskins, they're going to be pretty good against an army that doesn't have any ranged units whatsoever, and that includes the Vampire Counts. So you can take an entire Slayer army and just annihilate Vlad before he becomes an issue. The problem, though, is that while you might think you have choice, like you could go after Azak, you could go in the Darklands, you do have a bunch of choices in theory. In practice, you have one major problem in your campaign. And that problem is called Forgrim. Not Skarsnig, not Warzang, not Queek, but Forgrim. You want to keep Forgrim alive. Because if Forgrim falls, then all the enemies to the south will basically take over the entire south. Generally, they'll end up fighting each other, but you don't want to end up fighting enemies to the north while also fighting enemies to the south. Like, the last thing you want to do is, oh, I'll expand north, I'll take out Azag, I'll take out Vlad, to give the territory to, em to the Empire, maybe keep Castle Drakenhof or Southern Sylvania for myself. But the last thing you want to do is devote significant resources in other portions of the map 
where you will eventually encounter Grimgor. And then from the south, you'll get the combination of Skarsenek, uh, Tretch, Warzag, Queek coming in. War Warzag, less so. One of the things to understand, though, is while Skarsenek will be able to do a lot if he's left on his own, Tretch and Warzag will end up losing to Emmerich and to Queek, respectively. But then you have to deal with Queek. And this territory for the Dwarves is great, the Badlands territory. Is pretty good territory. There's a lot of good structures in there. In particular, Karakate peaks is a significant boon if you can take it in your capital. And this is where the major tension comes from Ungram's campaign. For his grudges, he wants to go north, but the best thing you could do in your campaign playing as Ungram is actually go south for a couple of reasons. Uh, the big reasons is you want to eliminate Skarsnik because the problem is while Forgrim may be able to hold his own or even win against Skarsnik on his own, though sometimes, especially when playing as either Belagar or Ungram, Forgrim struggles a lot when you're playing as either Belagar or Ungram. I, I think there's some weird behavior going on, different AI behaviors if you're playing different lords, or maybe the impact that you're playing a certain lord, the impact on the AI is such that Forgrim tends to lose when you're either playing as Belagar or Ungram. But you're going to have to help Forgrim out, because if you don't help him out against Skarsnake, it's not that Skarsnake will wipe him out, that very rarely happens. It's that Forgrim is going to be put on the back foot by Skarsnake, and then Warzag is going to show up with three, four full armies with Waz attached to them, so that's... 40 units per army, 160 units or 120 units being thrown against Karazakarak. There is no way that Forgrim is able to survive that. And even if he does, then all that's doing is giving time to Queek and others to annihilate other factions. Another thing to mention about the South is Kazador and Karakazul. Uh, now, Kazador can be a great ally, can be a good lord to confederate. But if you don't go help him out, he's certainly going to get wiped out by Queek. Like, Forgrim might be wiped out. Most of the time, he would be wiped out if you don't help him. But Kazador absolutely will if you don't do anything. You might not be able to do anything, but you might be able to get a military alliance and then confederation with uh, Kazador to get him as a lord and go to war against Queek. So what I would say is you have a bunch of choices. You could just take the Slayer, turn around, deal with Vlad. That is a particular option. And then maybe conquer Zufbar and go for Grand Peak, or just ignore Zufbar and go for Grand Peak. One particular annoying fact about um, Ungrim's campaign is that Zufbar really hates him. Like, you start with a minus 66 diplomatic relations with Zufbar. It, it's going to start increasing to minus 61, but still very bad relations between uh, Zufbar and Karakadrin. Forgrim, on the other hand, starts with amazing relations with Zufbar, as opposed to, to Ungram. Uh, this, by the way, creates the issue that you don't really have any training partners until you can meet Forgrim, until you can meet Kislev. I would avoid trading with Ostromark or doing any kind of diplomatic relations with Ostromark because that's just going to piss off Azag and Draka. The last thing you want to do in this campaign is piss off both of them and have both of them declare war on you. In fact, it's much better for you if Azag and Draka just exhaust themselves because then you can send the secondary army or tertiary army to just wipe out Azag. Um, so here would be my campaign plan if I'm playing as Ungram. Take the lair, then take Red Eye Mount, uh, then take the Red Pigs. Once that's done, and like once my army moves into the Red Peaks, I'll just recruit a second one. By that point, I'll be able to recruit Quarrelers. And with Quarrelers, I'll... And, and with the Quarrelers I recruit, I'll just send them over to Ungram. Maybe the Span Army, maybe keep it around dependent on if I have the money for it. But take Grand Peak and then take out Skarsnik. Yeah. Take his entire province. Now, you could decide to stop there, sell it to Forgrim, and move back north to deal with Azak, the Silver Pinnacle. But it's actually a better plan to not waste the time marching north like that, or not, or marching north without conquering territory. So you may want, if you're going south, and this is a key aspect in every campaign, if you start going in a direction, don't turn around because there might be another threat. You're going to waste precious, precious times. Always keep the initiative, always move forward, always seek battles. You don't want an army to sit there multiple turns doing nothing, just traversing. Because this traversing this territory from uh, the World Edge Archway all the way to the north is very time-consuming. You want your secondary tertiary armies 
to handle anything up north. Typically, that's going to take the form of Vlad. Vlad likely going to declare war uh, against you. Though, you might be able to prevent this by declaring war on his natural enemy. Maybe even building a secondary army to take some territory uh, and giving it and selling it to him. You're going to end up in a war against uh, against Vlad. But outside of Vlad himself, the army is not, quite, uh, not that strong. And the only territory that Vlad can attack, remember, he can't use Android is actually going to be Karakadrin, which has a pretty substantial garrison in its own right, even if you get rid of the Slayer Shrine. And I would personally advise that you do uh, get rid of the Slayer Shrine, because it's not really that great as, as a structure. Because Slayers themselves are the weakest unit in the Dwarven roster. Weaker than Miners, actually. Like, Miners at least are cheap. Cheap to maintain, cheap to build. Like Slayers, even with minus 25% upkeep, still are 169 upkeep, which is more than a unit of Quarrelers. Yes, you can reduce it even further. There's an ancillary you can gain that gives you an additional minus 25% upkeep. But even then, they're still way too expensive for what they offer. Like, I'd prefer having a lot of Dwarf Warriors than having Slayers. And even better, I'd prefer to have Quarrelers than I'd rather have Slayers in my army. On top of that, if you pause the research at the beginning of every turn, and you should do this by every turn, like just cl uh, click on whatever you're researching at the time, you have a chance when you level up a lord or um, hero to get an ancillary. It's either the archivist, which is door specific, or the student. Each of those uh, increases your research benefit by 10%. But if you have Slayers in an army, you have a chance of getting a Slayer and Celery. And I think that if you have Slayers and you're in, you're, you get the chance of getting that, but I think it interferes with your ability to get the Archivist or the Student. It just feels to me like whenever I've played an Azungrum, it feels to me like I've gotten less Students and less Archivists in my campaign. And having a high research rate is actually one of the few benefits the Dwarves have in their campaign so it is an issue uh, to deal with uh, to deal with like actually using slayers might be highly detrimental to your campaign beyond their weakness in combat and you don't want to just charge slayers in a battle uh, towards the enemy now um beyond that what should you do you could as I stated, stop here, or you could take Mount Silver Spear, take Crookback Mountain. Your army is going to be able to annihilate Tretch Craven Tail uh, pretty easily in an open field battle. Even if you just decide to max out Slayers in your army, which you shouldn't. You should get a couple of Slayers, then get Artillery, get Quarrelers, have a combination of Slayers and Artillery and ranged units if that's what you want to do. And always keep the Slayers in the back line. You don't want them to be the first units they engage. Like, it's better to have Quarrelers engage in melee because of their thick armor than it is to have Slayers. At least against most armies. Against something like the Vampire Counts, uh, different situation, of course, because of the pure melee situation of their army roster. But, and even Skaven, because Skaven, while they do have good range, a lot of Skaven armies tend to be made up of a bunch of, like, clan rats, Skaven slaves, all that, so... Uh, you can absolutely just directly charge a Skaven army, unless they have Night Runners or Gutter Runners or Heavy Artillery or Rattling Gunners. Yeah, charge Rattling Gunners with Slayers, they'll just get and uh, they'll just end up being wiped out pretty quickly. But deal with Tretch. By the time you arrive here in uh, the Desolation, he's likely going to have taken the entire province. So you're going to have to take a lot of this on your own. And you should take the Darkhold. It does have a pretty good structure in it. And then march over here, take... Uh, take the Black Fortress, take the Sentinels, maybe take the entirety of the Darklands with Ungram's army. Take all of it, and then you'll likely encounter, or portions of it, and then you'll likely encounter Grimgor, and you're going to end up in a fight with Grimgor. That's what happens if you fight in the Darklands. This is the tension that Emmerich has in his campaign, because he has Weak Creek to the west, Gors to the east, and... Grimgor to the north. Now, if you're playing as Ungrim, you could give a lot of the territory you take in the Dark Lands to Emmerich, make him as an ally, because he is pretty powerful as an AI faction. He generally carves out a lot of territory. He can hold back Gorst and, Qu and Queek on his own. He may not be able to hold back uh, Grimgor, but if you can just focus on Grimgor and wipe him out, then the northern part of the Dark Lands will be yours for the taking. While your main army is going south and going on this adventure in Darklands, you should be building up a second ar army. It will take time, but once you but you don't have any natural foes. Like if you can avoid pissing off Azak, maybe even giving him some money for some temporary like non-aggression pact, 
or just giving him money so he's less likely to attack you. If you do that, your territory can actually be pretty safe until inevitably you become too powerful, people view you as, as a strategic threat and declare war on you. But your tertiary, your secondary and tertiary armies should be able to deal with Azag and then should be able to deal with Draika. Avoid fighting Draika directly, she's a very nasty fight, or only fight her directly when her army has been weakened. Like if she's laying siege to a settlement, uh, under Azak, she tends to win the engagement against Azak. Or if her army has been wiped out, just send an army over here to the Witchwood, uh, or sorry, the Griffinwood, uh, and sack it and gain a substantial amount of money. Another thing to mention about your starting position is quite a few cafe and caravans might be marching through the Silver Pinnacle. So if you can take the Silver Pinnacle, fortify it, and maybe keep a lord with a couple of units, you can raid cafe and caravans or just raid them in general. But yeah, your secondary and tertiary armies should secure the north here, while your main army should never stop, should keep going south, conquer the entire south. Like what I do is take the uh, take Mount Silver Spear, maybe trade, uh, maybe sell it to Forgrim, or maybe even sell it to the Darkland Orcs for some temporary amount of money. Um, but then uh, take the Desolation for yourself, get the Howling Waste, give those to Emmerich so he keeps back Gorst and maybe Greasus if he's still around. And then take um, the Howling Wastes for, um, not the Howling Wastes, rather. Uh, take uh, take the Plain Ozar, take the Wolflands for yourself, take the Blasted Wastes. And that, of course, will put you in contact with Grimgore. Fight Grimgore, defeat Grimgore, take this entire portion. While your second arms are securing Nerf. Once Azag and Drykar are wiped out, there's no faction in this territory that are gonna, that is going to put pose a problem uh take the like if draga has taken over parts of the ostermark take it and sell it to kislev you don't want to expand over here in the ostermark give it to kislev hell even give northern sylvania to kislev what you should keep is southern sylvania now if you fight vlad and you can defeat vlad with the secondary with the secondary army if especially if it's supported by a uh, third army uh, like the vampire counts have one major weakness they're really bad at defending in a siege. So you can, if you can cap, get Vlad's army to be in a settlement defending, then your range units and quar your quarrelers, your artillery can absolutely shred this entire army to pieces. It might take a couple of goes. One of the things I would do is have movement points, launch an attack wave, expand the ammunition, then retreat from the battle, take no losses in, uh, uh, no losses in exchange. There's a lot of dead zones in burial territory, uh, imperial settlements pull back, then attack again, until you win. Deal with Vlad, and then you have to deal with Zofbar one way. Diplomatically, it's going to be a harsh situation to deal with Zofbar. You, you might prefer if Vlad actually wipes out Zofbar, which he absolutely can, and he tends to do in a lot of campaigns. So you might prefer if that happens, then take uh, Blackwater Province for yourself, or you could go to war against Zufpar yourself, if you so desire, especially if they've been weakened by fighting Vlad, because Vlad will wipe out their armies and might even capture a lot of their territories. Um, you could, And rec recapture any territory that um, that Vlad has taken. I would sell it, I would personally sell it to Kislev. You want Katrin specifically to be powerful, because you want Katrin to uh, hold your northern flank. Now, looking at the victory conditions, right? Uh, you don't have anything specific except dealing with the grudges and uh, taking over 75 sal uh, 70 settlements. So you can go for whatever direction you want. You can conquer the entirety of the Badlands all the way to Camry. Uh, you can encounter Forek uh, and, of course, confederate Forgrim, Forek, and then eventually Belagar, if you so desire. You can go into the Darklands, you can go into the Mountains of Morn, though I would not necessarily recommend it because a lot of these regions are not worth the money you're investing in because they are they only have minor settlements, though Karakazorn can be useful, even if they don't have the special structure when you're playing as dwarves for whatever reason. Um, but you do have a bunch of options when you are playing as dwarves. Though, here's my conclusion. I think if you want to play a campaign in this particular chunk of territory, you're far better off playing as Forgrim because you'll deal with the same exact issues that Un uh, that Ungram does, except the northern ones. You don't have to deal with the northern issues for a long portion of your campaign. You'll have good relations with Zulfbar, and you can focus on dealing with Skarsnik, dealing with uh, with Tretch, and then, of course, dealing with Warzag. The Warzag is an issue that's going to fix itself, because what Warzag tends to do is he throws a lot of armies towards the north, and that leaves his territory exposed, and then once Queek deals with 
uh, Gorfang Rotgut. Quake just throws a bunch. Uh, Quake and Malagor throw a bunch of armies against Warzag, wipe him out because Warzag doesn't go back to defend, and then eventually Warzag loses. Like that's an issue that's going to solve itself. But if you want to play a campaign here, I would strongly recommend playing as Forgrim as opposed to playing as Ungram. Better campaign benefits, better lord, and you will eventually get confederations with Ungram as well. Like, if you just want to use Ungram, like, the most fun you're going to have with Ungram is having him lead an army as opposed to generic dwarf lord. He is better at it, fair enough. Um, but it's just better to play as Forgrim in this situation or Belagar in this situation from my perspective. Like, For uh, Forgrim in particular. Forgrim does have a harsher start than Ungram, but he has a much better campaign potential and just a better campaign overall. As it stands, I see a little reason to actually bother with the campaign as Ungram. Just there's just too much pain and suffering, and the way the campaign is structured right now, it like you're supposed to have like this du northern dwarven campaign, but in reality, what you want to do is the southern uh, dwarven campaign, or else even if you ignore the fact that you will lose Forgrim and without a mod, you won't be able to confederate them. Uh, even ignoring that, you're just in for a lot of pain and suffering if you ignore the south in favor of the north playing as Ungram. So that's that's what I'd say about this campaign. It's not recommended. It's not a good campaign. I mean, Ungram is a fun character. He's a great character, but I just feel like he's not handled well right now in Warhammer 3. What would I say he would need? Well, I would say he would need a faction-wide benefit to buff his slayers, specifically in their survivability. In what way? Well, things like ward save, physical resistance, giving dwarves better casualty replenishment, uh, changing uh, disability, journey's end. Like, if you want to understand how a faction with uh, that has units with low armor does it well, Warzak, although he has a lot of issues with his faction buffing the Savage Orcs faction-wide, he can lead an army of Savage Orcs very well. In fact, it's the army you want to have for him because he gains significant benefits for their survivability. He gets physical resistance for them. That's what the Slayers would need. Not melee attack, because not melee attack for the units, but rather physical resistance, maybe a ward save. Those would do a lot for Slayers. But as it stands right now, the fashion benefits are not great. Costini, you're signing out. Don't forget to subscribe, like, enable notifications, and stay tuned for more.